Welcome to the Audit and Accounts Committee meeting, Monday 26 March 2018. First, the housekeeping. No fire alarms are scheduled for this afternoon. If the fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the building immediately. Fire exits are located at the rear side of the room. Go down the stairs and meet in the War Memorial Park. Please note this meeting is being webcast live on the internet. Check with officer for confirmation. We have confirmation. Please can all members and public switch their phones off to silence, please. I have apologies from Councillor Watts and Councillor Rowland is being replaced by Councillor Miller for this afternoon's meeting. Any declarations of interest? Raise it later if it's appropriate. Any urgent matters? None. Minutes of the meeting held 22nd of January. Can I take those as a true record? I'll take that as, as agreement. Item five, recommendations received from the Economic Planning and Housing Committee. We received a recommend, uh, recommendation at their meeting on the 25th of January 2018, the committee made the following recommendations to the Audit and Accounts Committee. Request that the Audit and Accounts Committee consider the unallocated Section 106 money contributed by developers in lieu of affordable housing delivery at its next meeting in tandem with work on the Investor Grow Fund consider whether the money could be utilised. There have been a number of emails on this subject uh, all of which have gone to um, EPH and the chairman tells me no further work is required by this committee. The committee decided that we should be asked to do this and now the chair has decided we shouldn't. That's odd. The chair has decided that the committee have sufficient information and, no, and any further work we do will only repeat it. I leave it with that committee. I'm, I'm told they've already had all the information they need. Uh, item six, viewing of social networking sites. Uh, page 11. Not a great deal of activity. Are there any questions? No, then we can move on. Item seven, the property investment strategy implementation report. Uh, quarter three. Do I believe will be Steve? It will in part, Chairman. Can I just say, you, you normally would have um, been expecting Nick Green to make these presentations to you. For anybody who's not aware, Nick left the authority about six weeks ago. So the gentleman who is sat on my far left at the end is Charles Hawkswood. Charles is here covering Nick's position on an interim basis. So going forward, it will be Charles who is presenting to you. On my immediate left is my colleague, Jamie Young. Jamie has joined us uh, in the short term to give us some assistance uh, with some of the investment work that's been undertaken. And I'll ask Jamie in a moment just to run through activity in the third quarter. Uh, you may recall that at the last meeting, uh, committee asked that in terms of investment acquisitions, we provided certain additional information, including information on uh, related IRRs and the like. You will now see that Appendix 3 uh, includes that additional information that was requested. So I'll just ask Jamie to uh, run through quarter three activity, and then we can respond to any questions afterwards. So over, over the period, we acquired approximately 10.3 million pounds worth of properties, producing 615 pounds and 1113 pounds worth of additional rent, rent, rental income. We acquired a retail warehouse asset, and we also acquired an industrial asset, so helping to boost the revenue from that 
from those investments. The rest of the report contains an update generally on the commercial property market, which over the period is the interest from investors in the se sector has been very strong. There's a lot of demand for commercial property assets at the moment. In terms of the commercial investment acquisitions, we were advised by Cushman and Wakefield, and there was, there's been an allocation of £30 million worth of funds to acquire assets, and we are on, on a weekly basis reviewing potential investments that come through accordingly from our advisors as well. We've provided in this report some additional information in terms of, sort of the returns that we're receiving from some of these new investments which have been providing returns, average estimated returns in the region of 8%. There are, another, there are a number of transactions ongoing at the moment which, were, which have been approved and one involving a purchasing of a long leasehold interest on Bell Road which in effect involves demolishing an existing building which will be pre-let to Veolia. At Basing View, we've been involved and we are working on the, uh, securing an existing tenant on this of, of the councils, at the, which is Eli Lilly, which is involved in funding a pre-let grade A office building on Basing View. So that will benefit Basing View more widely and also provide additional income as well. On the asset management side, we are reviewing and regularly reviewing opportunities to re-gear leases with existing long lease holders, where also, which may involve simply granting a lease holder, taking a premium and granting a lease holder a new lease, or may involve development as well. We've been working on asset reviews as well, which we're resourcing ap appropriately. And on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the property management, we've been working on securing new lettings, rent reviews. We completed a number of lease renewals and day-to-day -day dealing with requests from tenants for landlords' consents. We've also been working on with the Invest Grow Fund as well, with the resident resi opportunities for the council to invest in residential investment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I'll just ask a couple of questions, then I'll call on the other councillors. Uh, um, paragraph seven: Investment disposals. I'm not sure what properties we are identifying at the moment as being surplus to requirements, but I'm sure there must be some out there, and we should be already know what they are. Um, the review of the existing investment portfolio and the identification of potentially surplus properties is really a strand of work that hasn't uh, actively kicked off yet. One of the reasons for that is, is that we are in the process of verifying all of the lease data. Um, you may recall that we uh, we employed a lease analyst a few months ago to start reading through all our leases to ensure that lease data was 100% accurate. Uh, that exercise will be completed around uh, the middle of April, uh, at which point it will all be loaded into the new technology forge system, and we believe that will then give us the springboard to um, to start that formal review process. So we can expect to see something for our next meeting. Uh, next meeting may be slightly premature, given that the next meeting will probably be in June, but I would think certainly for September we would have something that is starting to come forward for you, yes. Thank you. <coughs> and my, my second question, on Appendix 1, I notice that uh, our Investment Acqui Acquisition Summary Report includes a number of properties outside the borough. Are you saying that at the moment we can't find enough possibilities within the borough? Um, it's quite simply at this stage, we are not excluding anything. So we, we, we look appropriately, uh, as, as you're aware, these are all opportunities that for a variety of reasons have not 
gone forward. Um, but I think it, it becomes increasingly difficult just to source investment opportunities in Basingstoke. Is there anything to add to that? The primary focus has been on Basingstoke and opportunities within the portfolio. In terms of getting some diversity, in terms of different types of property, we're looking at other similar locations in and around Basingstoke where we can get the sort of returns and exposure to different sectors as well. Thank you. Councillor Keating, sorry to keep you waiting. Thank you, Chair. I've long had an interest in item nine of us using some of our investment money uh, towards residential, but I can honestly say that the lack of information coming out of this item is extraordinary, especially when Philip told me sometime before Christmas, we have a, we're looking at a number of things. Now, I know you're looking at a number of things, but not telling us doesn't help. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, th I think the situation is that this, this is a retrospective quarter three, so this is activity up till December of last year. There has been a draft report now that has been received by Deloitte, which, which Philip is uh, coordinating, and there is a report going to SMB tomorrow, I understand, for them to consider the contents. So again, I think we would, be, we would expect that after that meeting, uh, something in rather more detail will be coming forward to this committee. I, I just want to register, it's disappointing that we've got no information so far. Whether, whether things are going on in the background and it's happening after this doesn't help us. Thank you. I think we can note that um, we are surprised that it has taken this long to get anything before the committee. Councillor Rattigan. Sorry, Chair, to bring you some bad news on the property situation. Um, we have a piece of property in Swan Street in Kingsclare. Uh, I have been informed by your property team that the lease on that expired in 2006 for the people who are currently renting it. And they've been in a holdover period for 12 years. I find that absolutely disgusting. Uh, that means that we are not working our, our assets properly. We are not ensuring that the people in there are paying the correct amount of um, rent to us, that we are in a position where w if we wish to move it on, sell it, buy, change it, we are not in the right place. This, um, this is awful. And um, although you've got somebody in to look at that, a 12-year period for a piece of property that is fundamental to, to Kingsclare because it's rented out to local businesses and is iconic in the main street of Kingsclare is not sufficiently good enough. And I would ask that something is done about that um, to, to either bring it forward to this committee to find out why something should be left in abeyance for that length of time and that um, somebody gets a rap over their knuckles for the situation arising. Uh, I'd like some comment on that, and I would like your referral to somebody who can deal with it. You're going to get a comment, yeah. Um, clearly, I can't comment on what occurred for the previous 11 years before I was here. Um, all I would say to you is that just because a lease, and I, I speak to you as a principal, just because a lease has not been renewed, does not mean that, that properties are not being actively looked at. So it is not uncommon for a landlord to look at a, a lease expiry. I have a, in writing from an officer of this council that, uh, and a conversation that I had with him that the leaseholders are not paying the right amount of lease. That's, that's a deficit to this council and to every single taxpayer in this council. That is not good enough. Yeah, as I say, I, regrettably, I don't know the circumstances of the matter. We can get, I will get somebody to have a look at it and we will report back to you as to uh, what action we believe needs to be taken. All of us, 
Oh, yes, yes, yeah. But what I was proposing, Councillor Rattigan, is as you've raised the subject specifically, that yeah. we would also write to you personally to, to let you know what, it, what, is a, what is happening with the property. Thanks. OK, I think that is something that we do want to report back on, certainly um, under the matters arising from the minutes. But I think as soon as this information is available, if it could be circulated to members of the committee. I would also remind members, as it says on page three, members are encouraged to obtain any points of clarification on the reports on the agenda in advance of the meeting. If you want to raise something like this, it would have helped if the officers had known about it beforehand. So in future, if you want to raise something, please let the officers know and they can respond. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, just to confirm that I had the email on the 22nd of March, so the papers have already been written uh, before that and uh, received. They, we are talking about our, our, our property investments, and I feel it was the right occasion to pick it up when I had officers in front of me. No criticism for raising it. I just wish it had been raised with the officer earlier. Then we could have actually got a response today rather than leaving it to the next meeting or sometime between. Any other questions? Any other comments? Councillor Potter. Um, I mean, just to make the obvious point, I mean, Councillor Radigan has highlighted that one example. I mean, by definition, in terms of the scrutiny that will now take place, are there others that come into the same category? Um, you know, it seems to me it's the known unknowns bit, isn't it, really? But, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea just to double-check, I think, really, that we haven't got others that fall into the same category. If that's possible, please, Chair. Well, I assume this will come out of the review of the leases, which is being undertaken. Yeah, I mean, from, from my point of view, I'd probably say to you that there will be others. But this is the whole reason now why the Council in January of last year adopted the investment strategy and why we are now trying to work through it in a structured way to, to deal with these issues. So... Um, I don't think before that period of time that the portfolio has been as actively managed as it should have been. Um, we now have a structured strategy. We now are starting to get the resources that are required to do that, and, and we will work through it. But we're not going to review the entire portfolio in, in five minutes. So part, you know, this will be a prioritised basis um, in accordance with the annual property plan that has been approved by Cabinet. Councillor okay, Kibbit. I, I thank you for um, telling us that now finally it's being done, but I, I do remind all um, the members here that we've been talking about this since 2009, and it's taken an inordinate amount of time for this council to eventually bottom out the assets it's owned in a system whereby it was properly being monitored. And, and I, I think that example that Councillor Ratkin has just given demonstrates the gravity of the situation that we didn't have uh, MIS systems in place or in one place that meant that management was taking place of the property and, and we have a significant portfolio it was essential that it was done thank you well said anything uh, Councillor Keating thank you chair we may have a new investment strategy but we had a previous investment strategy I can assure you and we had a re report of this nature over the last 20 years and nobody has said to us oh we're mismanaging it we need to get a new person in to manage it properly it's effectively what we've been told uh, and I find that very disturbing because we have auditors and we have checks and balances of all kinds and all of a sudden now 2018 we've been told we not managed it properly we have big gaps we're looking now at the whole portfolio, and it'll take an, an inordinate amount of time, certainly unspecified time, to check it all. I would have liked to have had confidence in the auditors if this was the issue. Thank you. I think as we reported in the, uh, in the paper that we brought to this committee in December of last year, 
the processes that the council has in place for the management of its portfolio are robust. And as we indicated at that time, that is evidenced by both external audit and internal audit that has been um, obtained recently. What we're saying is now that uh, we are looking to improve the way we manage the property. That will be assisted by the new technology forge system that has been adopted. It will be assisting a city by ensuring um, that data is complete and we will work through it on a structured and prioritised basis. Um, I don't think I, I ever said anywhere here that there are big gaps in the way that the council has previously operated. Uh, it was good, it will now be better. And I think we've had assurance from the external auditors that they were satisfied with the systems we had in place. They weren't perfect, they needed improving, but they were adequate. Councillor Rattigan. It, just to Steve's point, I'll just remind him that Carillion's accounts were signed off by a reputable uh, accountancy firm as robust, and they went bust with billions of pounds worth of debt. <coughs> Your job as, as uh, as our officers is to make sure whatever you send them is robust and can be checked th through not just by them but by us and that you have confidence in the in the information that you provide for us and that not only is it accurate but it is a fair summation of what we would hope to see in our accounts that they are fair to our our tenants and are fair to our tax payers as we are collecting the correct rent. That's all we request of you. I'm glad that's all we ask. Any other questions? Okay, we'll note that report. Thank you very much. Moving on to item eight, the audit planning report. Over to Ernst and Young. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if I could uh, first of all, to uh, uh, do two things. Uh, first of all, uh, just to uh, introduce uh, Sabina Kuha, who is the uh, lead senior for the audit. Uh, I thought it would be interesting for Sabina to uh, come to the committee this afternoon to uh, see the committee uh, scrutinise our aud audit planning report, and it's a good opportunity for her to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, <coughs> if I could just pick up um, the, the previous item, there was some comment there about the uh, role of external audit, uh, indeed audit in general, about the uh, issue that's been raised by, by the councillor. Um, I'd make a couple of, of, of observations, really. Um, the, the first is that in terms of our responsibilities, they are primarily twofold, as members know. The first is to give our independent audit opinion about whether the council's financial statements for a year uh, present a true and fair view. So uh, within the bounds of materiality. So uh, to that extent, we would look at the income and expenditure recorded uh, in the council's uh, accounts, as well as the uh, balance sheet, which will include the valuation of uh, properties, including the properties that are being talked about. So to that extent, we give a view on the overall accounts. What we don't do is give a view on each and every individual transaction which may be recorded within them. So as I understand it from what's been said, uh, income was being received in respect of the property that's yeah, been yeah. raised. So, you know, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a question about that income being misclassified, misrecorded within the accounts. The question is the terms under which that income was being received by the council and whether there was a an appropriate rental uh, lease agreement in place or not, as the case may be. So, in that sense, you know, our responsibilities are clear towards the overall accounts. We also have a responsibility to form a value for money conclusion on the council's arrangements for securing common efficient effectiveness. Uh, again, that would depend on our assessment of what would be uh, any significant risks to the council's arrangements. And insofar as th this may reveal a weakness in internal procedures and controls of the council, then we would uh, take that into consideration when the uh, facts of the case were, were known. Um, the second point I'd made in respect to that is that there is also a role for internal audit in terms of giving assurance to the council about the operation of internal controls and processes in the council. So they, yeah, they may have an observation to make. Obviously, they weren't here with the item in, in, in question, but they they do have that primary role in response in, in respect to the internal control systems and procedures. So I, I would just make that that observation as well. 
In terms of the audit planning report itself, which starts on page 33 of your agenda pack, uh, it sets out the uh, work that we will undertake as uh, the Council's external auditors. As I've mentioned just now, the two principal responsibilities are to give an opinion on the Council's financial statements for 2017-18 uh, in terms of whether they <coughs> present a true and fair view, uh, but also to reach a value-for-money conclusion on the Council's arrangements for securing economy efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, in terms of the uh, overall approach to the audit, the summary on page 37 uh, of your agenda pack gives a summary of the uh, key issues uh, that we would take into consideration uh, when we uh, discharge our responsibilities. So effectively what you have there is a series of uh, risks which we've identified in respect of the uh, financial statements. Uh, and those risks are then elaborated on uh, on pages 41 to 43. Um, I would just make the observation that in terms of the items included uh, on page 37, management override is included in all of our audit plans uh, because the audit standards uh, dictate that we include it. Uh, and the point I make uh, uh, is that its inclusion does not imply any specific or heightened concerns about the integrity of management as I say, it does derive from uh, auditing standards. We do also include uh, risks around uh, property uh, valuations and also uh, IS-19 pensions uh, disclosures, uh, primarily because they are uh, large numbers in the council's accounts, particularly the balance sheet, yeah. and because their nature in, uh, means that they involve a very high degree of estimation. So. Uh, property valuations, for example, and also the work that actuaries do to provide the figures that uh, are included for pensions. We do also uh, include uh, a, a risk around the uh, non-domestic rates uh, appeals uh, provision, which is quite substantial given the business base that the council has. So again, that's an estimation process which the council uh, undertakes. Um, and we uh, also uh, have included uh, a risk around the accuracy, accuracy of lease disclosures, again, which is a, is a reflection of the Council's substantial uh, property portfolio. The final uh, risk which we include as an other area of focus is the earlier deadline for the production of the financial statements. Uh, as members will know, uh, there, were, uh, there are new regulations which mean that the deadline for producing the uh, annual accounts and having and then audited and published uh, for 1718 does move forward from the end of September to the end of July. Now, clearly, that is a substantial uh, shortening of the timeline, uh, and we have been working quite closely with uh, officers uh, to make sure that we are in a good place uh, to meet that challenging timetable. So, for example, in the uh, interim audit visit, which we have just completed, we have sought to do. Uh, more work uh, before the end of the financial year compared to previous years on the basis that uh, the less you have to do after the end of the financial year, the more you mitigate the risk of uh, missing the deadline. And the challenge is perhaps not one so much for any individual authority to produce the accounts that little bit earlier. Uh, the challenge is as much for us as audits, uh, uh, auditors to actually audit all of our clients before the end of July, and that is that is the, the, the real challenge that we have. In terms of other points to draw out to your notice, uh, page 38 uh, sets out our approach to materiality and how we will uh, consider materiality and also the uh, figure for what we call audit differences, which is uh, set at 50,000. Uh, that is actually the same as previous years and that is a level at which the uh, committee has expressed its view that it would wish uh, any unadjusted differences to, uh, to be reported and we continue to apply that same threshold uh, on the assumption that the committee is happy to continue with that uh, requested level of uh, reporting uh, threshold. We also consider um, our value for money conclusion. So uh, we, on page uh, 46, uh, set out the uh, responsibilities that we have for the value for money conclusion. Uh, at, the, uh, at the time of, of drafting this report, we haven't identified any significant risk to those uh, arrangements in place at the Council, uh, but we, it is something that we keep under review as we do uh, risk to the uh, accounts process. Uh, in terms of other points that I would wish to draw to your notice, um, I do assume that uh, uh, members of the committee have uh, read the report. Mm -hmm. um, 
a couple of things just to to draw uh, out um, on page 50 at the bottom um, there is a, a small section which talks about the exercise of statutory powers um, and as it says there we have had issues raised uh, by a legal firm representing a local charity about the council's uh, proposed ho hotel development agreement uh, at Basing View um, the request uh, there, as it said, is that there are issues uh, concerning the, the Council's powers to enter into that agreement, uh, and it makes a request that we consider exercising our statutory powers under Section 8 of the Local Audit and Accountability Act, effectively uh, an advisory notice and questioning the Council's uh, legal basis for entering into that agreement. Um, we are considering the um, uh, issues raised. Uh, we have had discussions with officers and we will consider information and evidence available, for example, the uh, legal advice that the Council has taken in respect of that agreement. Um, so we will include our findings in our audit results report, which we will bring back to the July meeting of the committee. Um, the other uh, point I did just uh, briefly want to raise, uh, I've talked about um, the uh, imperative for fast to close and the additional work that we've been able to do at our interim stage. Um, we have, have had some um, delays in the uh, receipt of information with respect to what we call data analytics, which enables us to do the audit. So we are working with officers to make sure that those delays uh, are mitigated and that they are resolved for the uh, final part of the audit because there will be no contingency for any overruns or delays once we get to that post statements period because of the compressed nature of the timetable uh, that we will be operating to both here and across our clients as a whole. The only other uh, point I wish to uh, draw out, uh, page 54 uh, sets out the timeline for the audit. Uh, essentially the key end date is the end of July uh, and the meeting of, of the committee which is right at the end of July to consider our audit results report. Uh, which, uh, assuming the audit goes to plan, we would then be in a position to uh, report our findings, the committee to consider them, and then subsequently to issue the audit report, uh, enabling publication by the 31st of July. And then the final point to draw out, page 61, uh, is the appendix which deals with uh, audit fees. Um, as members will know, 2017-18 uh, is the final year of the current framework contract under which we hold the uh, audit appointment uh, here at the Council mm -hmm. and those fees have been effectively fixed for uh, the period up to and including 2017-18. Um, the uh, note there does refer to the fact that the uh, consideration of the issues raised and potential exercise of statutory powers is uh, outside of the scale fee and there will be an additional fee for our consideration of those issues and uh, there is also uh, going to be a small additional fee for the delays in analytics data. Um, we will actually quantify those and report back when we come back to the committee in July. Um, <coughs> it's not actually contained in this report but the one final point I would make is that um, while 1718 is the final year of our uh, audit under the current arrangements, um, there are new arrangements in respect of 2018, 19 and beyond. Uh, the Council has uh, entered into the uh, procurement uh, partnership with PSAA Limited under which um, Ernst & Young have been appointed auditors from 2018, 19 um, and subsequent years. Um, the one point uh, as we're talking about fees is that just to note that as part of that framework contract uh, process, uh, PSAA have announced scale fees for 2018-19 uh, and those fees show a further reduction of 23% compared to 2017-18. So uh, that is a reflection of the effectively the national process through which PSAA procured the audits for I think something like 98% of local authorities. So just to, to give uh, some context there for, for members when we look ahead to 2018-19. That's all I'd wish to say by way of introducing the audit plan, uh, but I'd be very happy to take any comments or questions which members of the committee may have. Thank you. Right, before we move to questions, um, that's one thing for the committee on to agree on materiality. 
are we happy with the audit differences being reported at the level of 50,000? There were none last year, but I think it's still a useful report back to us if there are any. Are we happy with that? Mm -hmm. Right, that will remain then. Okay, Councillor Rattigan. Right, the tricky one first. Uh, you've alluded to the statutory powers. Um, obviously, that's going to cost the council additional money if you come back in. Are we allowed to reclaim them from the referrer? Is that is that possible under law? Uh, I'm not a legal expert, um, but uh, my understanding is that uh, there there is there isn't a provision for those costs to be uh, reclaimed by the person raising them. Uh, it is a principle of the legislation, uh, including, for example, the rights of, of, of local electors and other interested parties, if they wish to make an objection, um, that they are able to do so. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, um, it may be something which the council's uh, legal uh, team may advise on. As far as I'm aware, there is no provision for those costs to be borne other than by the council uh, against which the issues are, are raised. Because I guess it's a fundamental principle that um, th you know, the intent, I think, behind that would be that um, local electors can raise issues and have them considered without, if you like, having to um, be concerned about potentially the costs of, of doing so. So in a sense, it's a... Um, a reflection of the importance of those local rights that they aren't effectively compromised or um, uh, by uh, potentially having to pay what could be very substantial costs. Ultimately, it's, it's a question of the legislation. It's not a question for us to determine as auditors. Chair, therefore, I, if, if there was a number of spurious uh, referrals, then, then obviously it would cost this council a lot of money. And I just think we there ought to be some some way of sieving what it, naturally people want and understand uh, their rights to f uh, that's okay uh, but when people are putting in um, unsubstantiated uh, queries then obviously that 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 would lead us to a, a blank check in as far as this concerned. I just want to raise that secondly if I if I may uh, on page 37, you, you highlighted the earlier production of the, the financial statements. You alluded to some additional work you've had done in the interim information that you've had. Um, uh, is there any more that you feel that internal audit could do to, to quicken that process, help that process for you so as that information is ready for the deadline? I think um, it, it's, it's primarily um, uh, ourselves working with the, the finance team to ensure that we uh, can do uh, more work uh, uh, earlier, which is what we have managed to do uh, in a number of areas this year compared to last year. So I think f from our perspective, it's, it's making sure that we have that discussion and engagement with, with the finance team so that we're both clear about expectations, we're clear about what it is that we need for us to do our job as efficiently and effectively as possible. Uh, it's about making sure that we have clear, agreed timelines. It's about ensuring that um, deliverables are delivered within the timescales uh, agreed, uh, so that we're, and we're aware of the uh, visit uh, dates for when we're coming in, uh, and that we have availability of the finance team to, to respond to queries. So it's really around good, effective project management and planning so that we are very clear, very precise about what it is we need, when we're coming in, what kind of responsiveness we need uh, because as I say with um, effectively the audit window <coughs> used to be June July August and September in this in essence we have lost August and September so the audit window for local government is effectively halved so what it means is that we have to plan very carefully to deliver not just here but for all of our clients in that compressed window so we have very clear defined uh, visits uh, in terms of timing and it's essential that we achieve and complete everything that we need to in that uh, compressed space because essentially there is no contingency because either you're up against the deadline or if you're earlier on the process you have other clients who follow you so that's what makes it critically important 
that we actually, from both sides, it's not just um, from the council side, it's from our side as well, that we are clear about um, what our commitments are and that we deliver on those commitments because, as I say, it is a, a, a significant challenge and, as I say, that the key actual challenge for us is to deliver all of our clients in that window, not just some of them. Um, and that's what we are obviously uh, planning to do and that's what we have had in the discussion. We have, we have resourced the audit. Uh, as I say, Sabina is, is our team leader and we have a team that will be coming in as well. So at this point, we, we have resourced the audit as, as far as we uh, have determined we need to resource it. Uh, I know the council's finance team are similarly uh, resourced from their side. Of course, there will always be uh, you know, the unforeseen events in terms of uh, potential availability and so on, but at this point, it's resourced and we have a plan and uh, we are on track to achieve that plan. So as I say, that's the position now. We obviously keep that under uh, continuous review. One final point, if I may. Um, you, you're saying you're having trouble with analytics. Can I suggest that Cambridge Analytics are losing clients yeah, at the yeah. moment and therefore maybe it will take on your additional work? Uh, I think we may be talking about a different kind of analytics here. Councillor Keating. Thank you, Chair. Going back to page 37, I understand what the words are saying. And simply saying increase in focus uh, is a different assessment that I would be using because red and yellow are effectively red flags to us. And you were effectively saying, you were effectively saying, well, it'll just be a bit more increase in focus. It, that is not a significant risk, if you, see what I, if you see what I mean. It doesn't generate that level of enthusiasm to fix things. You understand what I'm saying? Could you perhaps help? I, I think it may be the, 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 the way that we, um, you, that our terminology, when, 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 when we say increase in focus, it means that we are placing more emphasis on this than we have in previous years. Now, it could be because it's a reflection, for example, of uh, the focus from uh, regulators who inspect uh, uh, auditors, so hence uh, PP evaluation, IS-19. Uh, it can be because actually something is, is slightly different uh, or in our risk assessment. But uh, I think you're right that actually the key point here is that when we look at the second column, um, we are, in terms of the, the risk, then an other area of focus means that it's not significant in terms of risk, whereas the top one is always significant in terms of risk. So in that sense, an other area of focus is a slightly less uh, important uh, thing for us to look at in terms of the audit. Uh, if something is a significant risk or a fraud risk, that, that means that we think there is a significant risk of a material misstatement. The others, we don't think there is, but we still think it's uh, useful and important that they are recorded there. And in terms of the uh, colours, in terms of the red and well, I'm actually colourblind, whatever that other colour is, yellow or green, it could be one of either. Yeah. Um, it, it simply means that uh, increasing That's focus means, idea. yeah, it, increasing focus means that uh, we've actually putting more focus on it this year compared to previously, whereas no change in, in focus means that actually it's, it's, it's effectively the same as it has been previously. So it's actually trying to give you an indication of those things which are relatively um, more of a focus this year compared to previously. Believe it or not, I understand what you're saying, even though it's difficult to understand, because my interpretation of these uh, reds and yellows uh, is that we need to take account of them. So if you're reading a 40,000 page document and, you get, and, and you're trying to get to sleep and you've got a big table to put your documents on, you end up going to sleep first. But the point I wanted to make was, if it's red, in our view, that means action today, or action just immediately soon afterwards. If it's anything other, it's something we need, we could relax about a little.
red in, in, is, is from our perspective an increase in focus. From, so in other words, we will give it a greater audit focus. It doesn't uh, imply that we think the council uh, is at risk, particular risk of, of getting it wrong, uh, but it's something from an audit perspective that we will, we will uh, uh, focus on. If I may, Chair, I do understand, and thank you for that, but we, we don't need to focus on that anymore. Could I now go to page 54? And this is your timetable. And we're halfway through. We're four months in, and there's four months left. And the simple question is, are you halfway there? We are where we would uh, want. Okay. Well, I think it's, it's not quite halfway there, but there again, we would always expect there to be a significant amount post statements because there are only th there are things you can only do when you actually get the accounts themselves. So you can only check the disclosures once they're there and so on. Um, we we will, we are programming to uh, come back uh, for a short visit in April to basically pick up the the things that we didn't quite get. Uh, through uh, in the interim visit. So effectively what we have done is uh, slot that in so that in that key post statement stage which we would uh, look at in June and into July, it's actually trying to reduce what we have to do there to the minimum because that's where you have no contingency to come back and finish it off because there will, be, there will not be time. What time is that? Are you going to be on time? No, the answer could well be w yes or no. On the basis of what we have, what we know so. now and what we have planned, then the answer is yes. Uh, we, we would assess in our RAG rating internally, we assess the council as green in the, in the green, amber, red category of where do we think they're going to be, are they going to be at the deadline. So the council is assessed as green on that basis. Thank you very much. Councillor Faulkner. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Two, two points, uh, pages 42 and, and 43. These are really um, flagging concerns. I don't know whether this is for the auditors, but I've wanted to flag it. Um, the one is the collectible business rates in which we have got to make a provision. Um, I, mean, I personally have a problem with business rates because it breaches the first rule of fiscal policy, which is ability to pay. But that's for higher authority to discuss, I suppose. But what we've seen in the last six months with the business rate environment, it, it, I'm flagging the fact that that provision is an unknown which could be quite severe because of the situation outside which is beyond our control. So I've flagged that as a serious concern. Page was that? Sorry? What page that? That's page 42. Under, understatement of the NDR appeals provision. On the next page, accounting for the pension liability. Uh, since in my four years as councillor, we always seem to skip that one. As I recall in the last report, a year ago, that liability was 70 million. So this liability is growing at a rate greater than we collect council tax. Now, we we'll always say, well, that's just um, a technicality. But it appears in our balance sheet as a, as a huge liability. And someone somewhere one day, and un, maybe a generation as yet unborn, are going to have to pick up that liability. And I just find that, frankly, quite remarkable. Thank you. I would remind you that that is a, a figure which does go up and down um, from year to year. It isn't um, a constant increasing number. Uh, however, it is a horrendous number, I would quite agree. <laughs> uh, if, if, I, if I may, just to pick up um, th those two points. Uh, the, the point about the uh, NDR provision is that it is a provision for the cost of appeals which businesses make uh, against the rateable value that they have been assigned. So that is a requirement for the council to essentially calculate a provision for the costs of those successful appeals that businesses may lodge. 
um, necessarily it involves uh, an assessment of the likelihood of uh, appeals being successful and the extent to which those appeals are actually successful. So in that sense, it's, it is more about the cost of successful appeals that may be uh, lodged by businesses as opposed to, if you like, the collectability uh, and <coughs> the likelihood of collectability of the actual business rates. Uh, in terms of the pension liability, yes, it is a very substantial number, as, as, as you said, Councillor. Um, the, but the concept is that um, the basis of the, of the liability is that it will be uh, met over the very long term. It's not a liability <coughs> that is going to crystallise immediately, but the way that the accounting standards work is that you have to calculate the figure even though um, it will be effectively due over very, very many years into the future. And then there's a separate um, uh, point about the degree to which the scheme itself is funded and that the assets and the liabilities are matched over the course of the long term. And that's where you have uh, valuations, triennial valuations, and then you've got separate decisions about levels of contributions, uh, be they employer or employee contributions. But the overall aim is that the, uh, the scheme and the liabilities that fall due, uh, that they are matched with the assets from the scheme uh, over the course of the long term. So uh, yes, it looks like a very large and significant number, but certainly the theory is that it should be uh, matched by uh, contr future contributions, assets, uh, returns, and so on over over the very long term over which pensions uh, obviously uh, come into play. Thank you. Yeah, just to clarify your point on the on the business rate. So, if if Bristol Valuation Office sets um, rates that are subsequently then challenged, does that? You're saying that we then have to pay the cost of that appeal? That essentially is the case. That, that is the way that the um, um, regulations are framed, that, that, that councils now have to bear the cost of uh, appeals against uh, valuations. We might not like it, but that's the way it is. <laughs> Councillor Potter. Yeah. Um, just returning, if I may, for a minute to the um, section on the exercise of statutory powers and the um, hotel development agreement in respect of Basing View. I mean, just to put it on record, but I mean, I'm um, always disappointed but never surprised by Councillor Rattigan's comments on such matters, really. But um, as far as I know, we're not running a Politburo here, and I think it would be a sad day for um, accountable local government if. Um, individual taxpayers and charities and the like were threatened with having to bear the cost of this council as well as their own if they make a legitimate challenge against a decision of the council. Um, and in terms of the issue at hand, in terms of the potential unlawful expenditure, I mean, presumably you might have to look first of all how um, the decision of this council had given rise to that in the first place. But can I just check with you in terms of um, if that were to be the case, and I don't think I'll be holding my breath over this, um, would it be correct to say, as far as you know, that would supersede any contractual arrangements that had been made thus far in regard to the commitment regarding that development? Would that supersede any agreement that we'd made on that basis? Did I, well, negate then, sorry, I beg your pardon, it's a better word than supersede, sorry. What I would say is that um, um, we, we have been asked to consider issuing a what's called an advisory notice that that uh, would, in that eventuality, and I, I would stress that it would be, you know, it's an eventuality. Uh, we've not concluded our consideration uh, that we would issue an advisory notice to the council that we thought it uh, it was acting outside of its powers. Ultimately, as with objections to items of account. Um, these matters can only uh, be ultimately tested in a court of law um, as opposed to uh, anything which auditors may say. Um, and you know, there is always the potential for a judicial review to be, to be brought, uh, as there is against uh, uh, you know, decision, many decisions of the council. So you know, ultimately, the only, the only you know, arena in which a, a, a question of, of legality can be determined is a court, not, you know, an exercise of, of an auditor's power. Um, anyone else who's 
special procedure because the VA is managed by the Office of Honest Counsel. But the, um, the process of judicial review is known to me and known to this council. But in regard to timetable, the first, first steps being your steps, um, how far away from that uh, initial position that you might adopt on this do you think you are? Uh, essentially, the stage that we have reached is that we have uh, made uh, initial inquiries of the council in terms of documents and other uh, things which are relevant to our consideration and we are considering those at the present time and we would expect to again include our uh, consideration uh, if not before then in our uh, audit results report which we would bring to the July meeting of the committee. I've got Councillor Cubitt down next. Yeah um, in view of the fact that you've got to shorten the time frame and you've got to if you bid for this business going forward, accept 23% hit on the revenue streams. Are, is your company going to bid for local authority business post-2018? Uh, essentially, we have already bid and we've already got a contract. So the process uh, that PSAA uh, undertook was that they invited bids for um, six different lots uh, of varying size. Uh, and the results of that exercise were uh, announced last June. So of the lots on offer, um, <coughs> EY won what was known as Lot 2, which is the uh, second largest, which is roughly 30% of local authority audits. Okay. So we have already gone through that bidding process and we've been successful um, as a firm in, in uh, winning a contract which essentially means uh, that we will audit a range of authorities, including Basingstoke and Dean, uh, for a five-year period from 2018-19. Um, obviously, as a firm, uh, we bid on the basis of what we uh, felt we were uh, going to be able to deliver mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, bid prices which were submitted by all the firms for all of the lots. And it's a result of that process uh, and uh, PSAA actually now publishing the scale fees, um, which are a result of that procurement exercise. So in that sense, we, you know, we bid a price uh, and we were successful. So uh, on that basis, we, you know, we are committed to the market for at least another five years, which is the period of the contract from uh, 1st of April 2018. Councillor Rattigan. I know, David, you're a completely fair man, so therefore, please look at the tape and you will uh, pick up that I was questioning it, saying, could we pick up the, those fees if they were, uh, I think I never threatened anybody. I certainly don't, I'm, I don't threaten anybody in this council, uh, let alone. Our job as, a, as an audit committee chair is, is right that we question every, every penny we spend we make sure that for our taxpayers we get value for money and if there is a course of action that uh, we could take to recover costs we always should look at it. I, I totally accept that if there is no, no way that that can happen then that's, that's absolutely fine. The, as for the decision itself that will be reviewed uh, if they feel, feel uh, they, they should be. My, my further point is about the, the pensions liability and and to Graham's point, I wonder, with the deficit being as large as it is, uh, would it be beneficial that you put the triannual reviews so as we had from three, six, nine years ago the, the, the deficit, so as we can see if it is, as the chair says, a moving target, or if it's, it is on a slippery slope to, to costing, at least on the books, a substantial amount of money. I'm sure that, the, that that information can can be obtained either through ourselves or through the finance team in terms of what was the liability at each of the balance sheets for the last uh, however many years. Um, you're right, it does tend to, 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 to move around. It depends on a whole range of factors, so changes in underlying assumptions about longevity, uh, changes in assumptions about investment returns and so on. Uh, how the stock market is performing from you know from from from, from one point to the next, so it, it does tend to be uh, you know something of a volatile number because it is a snapshot at a point in time, based on conditions and assumptions at a point in time, and it doesn't take 
um, it, 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 it can take very small changes in assumptions about investment yields or indeed life expectancy, which given that you apply them over very long periods, quite small changes in assumptions can actually have quite a big impact on the size of the number which effectively gets churned out at the other end. So uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is a volatile number um, and you know, significant movements can, can appear alarming if they are substantial increases in liability. Um, but as I say, the, the, the principle is that the, the scheme is run, there are you know, set points for these triennial valuations with the idea that actually on it's sustainable into uh, the medium and the long term. So that's the basis upon which the, the scheme, which is a statutory scheme, is actually set up and then uh, run. Councillor Keating. Thank you. Um, briefly in relation to the, uh, the issue on pension liability, the stock market has gone through the roof in recent times. And that should have worked out many of the pension deficits. Would that be a correct assumption? That would be um, how how um, uh, the stock markets perform, how investments uh, have you know valuations have performed is one of the factors which go into the calculation of the of the liabilities. So you have a you have a valuation of the the fund assets, and you have a valuation of the fund liabilities. So. Yes, uh, I'm not an actuary, but that is one of the factors that would feed into the calculation of uh, the, the net liability for uh, the, the, the scheme at any one point in time. And a separate question uh, on the question of the understatement of uh, non-domestic uh, rates uh, appeals process. My understanding is from reports that every particular property owned by the NHS, in whatever form they own it, they're all now jumping on the bag wagon to appeal. And that would have a significant impact on non-domestic rates. Uh, if every single property that in the NHS uh, was to successfully appeal for charitable status. Um, if that was the case, then the other local, the other government properties that are taxed by local government would be in a similar category, and we would be decimated. We would effectively have national government saying no. And local departments have that same national government saying, oh, we're not paying them rates. Uh, you're right to the extent that there are um, a number of different types of properties um, which uh, are considered in terms of their rateable value. I am aware of the issue you mentioned with respect to uh, NHS trusts in particular. Um, ultimately, there is a process through which businesses, and businesses is in the... the you know, the broadest concept uh, of businesses that there is a mechanism for appeal, there is a mechanism for those appeals being considered and determined. Uh, and the, you know, the legislation is that the, the cost of those appeals uh, is borne by uh, local local authorities. Now, that's, that's the law. Um, you know, I think we're getting into the realms of you know, speculation of, well, what were to happen if mm -hmm. such a size of appeals for such a large category of businesses were to be successful and <coughs> you are right that uh, a successful appeal in one place can you know quite often then lead to similar appeals in other places for the same on the base on the same grounds so there is there is you know there is something of a of a kind of a you know a domino effect potentially there um, so yeah it, it then I guess becomes more of a broader <coughs> um, political question than it does one of a technical accounting Right, thank you for that. That was a, a very good presentation and uh, a very good response to the questions being raised. I've just got two points that I'd like to make before we close the item. On page 63 and 64, require communications. At some point, you are going to ask this committee about fraud. And at some point, you'll be asking about consideration of laws and regulations. Can you let us know exactly when you think you'll be asking those questions 
and can I ask officers to make sure that any relevant reports get to this committee before we have to respond? <laughs> Um, you're, you're correct, Chairman. We, <coughs> we do make um, <coughs> standard inquiries of um, those charged with governments, i.e. that committee. We make similar uh, requests in respect of management uh, and indeed internal audit. So we will be uh, making those requests. We, we, we do so around about this time because we uh, always ask that the response there, thereby covers the whole of the financial period. So we, we will be writing <coughs> to you to make those those inquiries as we have done in previous years. Uh, and uh, I guess it's then for, uh, for the committee to determine how it would want to consider the responses. Ultimately, those responses have to be with us uh, before we can conclude the audit. Uh, so there is, a, a, I think, a, probably a, logisti a logistical question of how and when the committee may wish to consider its response, which we would write to you as the chair, uh, chairman, to, to, to respond formally. So uh, I guess there is, a, there is a process point for the committee in terms of how it would wish to consider any proposed response and then uh, approve it in some form for uh, dispatch to, to, to us. I must admit the question was aimed more at officers than it was at you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, in that case, I think we can note the report. Thank you, Thank you very much for attending. And moving on to item nine, Investor Grow Fund third quarter reports. Thank you, Chair. Can I just uh, introduce George Richards from CBRE, who, the firm that manages the fund for us. Um, George will go through the report and uh, between us, we'll answer any questions. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, you've been presented with the quarter three update for the Investor Grow Fund. Uh, so I'll just run through uh, the, the, the key elements and, and as, as Philip said, welcome any questions. Um, and just to briefly remind those present that the fund, the, the key objective of the fund is to, is to provide capital uh, development funding to stimulate development projects uh, within the local, uh, local borough uh, to drive social and economic growth. The, fund, the total fund capacity is 25 million um, and uh, the fund was launched uh, towards the end of 2016 uh, and during the whole period of 2017 as being a big focus on uh, driving, uh, building the, the pipeline. Uh, the overall objectives are for the fund to be fully invested by March 2020, which is in line with other similar public sector funds uh, of this scale. Uh, with the first investment being achieved uh, in March 2018. So uh, in terms of uh, the work during quarter three, uh, it's very much been focused on uh, pipeline, but uh, the other key important uh, issue we've been, uh, we've been focusing on is around it's the fund's first investment, which is Project Siena, uh, which is a commercial opportunity uh, in Basing View. Uh, so just to cover both those points in terms of pipeline uh, and Siena briefly, it is all spelt out in the report, but t in terms of pipeline, we have a good uh, short, medium and long term list of a total of 30 projects across the full range of sectors being commercial, housing uh, and renewables, the, cre the three key focus areas. Uh, and we have three live opportunities that are uh, in discussion or negotiation stage with borrowers. Uh, that is uh, in addition to the, the, the funding opportunity around uh, Project Siena in, uh, for the Eli Lilly building in Basing View. Now, whilst those three are short-term opportunities, um, good prospects, that's not to say there won't be others coming forward uh, in the short term. Uh, the challenge is always for the fund around timing uh, of the projects uh, that are not fully in our control. They're driven by market conditions as well as planning. Uh, 
projects also need to be of sufficient scale for the fund, so whether it's housing, it needs to be, um, the minimum fund investment is a million pounds, so for housing projects it's, you would estimate circa 15 units as a minimum. Um, and, and also whether these borrowers and developers require third party financing, so a lot of them have their own credit facilities, they can draw down at competitive rates, so they take some persuading. Uh, to draw on the council's funding, uh, others, um, uh, you know, such as house builders and others, have their own credit lines and means of means of funding. So the pipeline is looking strong, and we're working hard to to bring this forward. It is covering all sectors, um, which we're pleased with. Uh, but the primary focus during quarter three has been on the the first anticipated investment, which is a commercial development. Uh, circa 45,000 square foot in Basing View. Um, and now the anticipated approach is that the council will forward fund the development of uh, a new office building that has been pre-let to Eli Lilly and Company, uh, retaining that occupier and that employer within the borough. Uh, and the estimated investment from the Invest to Grow Fund to support the delivery of this building will be in the tune of eight to 10 million. Um, subject to uh, how design costings uh, evolve over coming months. Uh, and this funding will be provided in addition to uh, LEP funding that has been awarded, uh, as well as um, a lump sum that will be received uh, off the back of the surrender of the existing site that, that the occupier owns uh, else in the borough. Now, the, prospect, the interest rate uh, that will be applied and has been agreed is 5.25%. Uh, which will be in excess of the, uh, the, the, the target return for the fund. Uh, uh, and the development will be carried out by Muse developers, who are the appointed partner uh, at Basing View, uh, with the council's investment fund uh, acting as the exit for the investment. So they will be uh, purchasing the completed asset uh, once it has been fully developed out. So. Uh, that is a background for Siena, uh, as well as the overall pipeline. There are other wider discussions ongoing, uh, uh, and we hope to continue that into quarter four, uh, as well as greater uh, further promotion from, um, of the fund uh, across the wider market. So that's all I propose to uh, spell out, set out at this stage. I'd, I'd welcome any questions, uh, if anyone has any. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Um, let's keep it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's it's more for the members um, together. We, we've had this discussion before. Everything that we seem to be doing at the moment is very commercial oriented. And our portfolio is already heavily skewed to exposure to the commercial uh, market. Um, and I know that there was wriggle room in this investor grow that could have gone towards residential and I know that there's a political will in some parts of this council for there to be support for um, expansion of or exposure to the residential market. And I know that the original consultants that we employed when we wanted to know where, what, uh, evaluate the sectors and the revenue streams from the different sectors, that actually commercial was not the highest generating revenue uh, producer of the different sectors that we could have invested in when it comes to real estate. So um, I'm not knocking the deal that's here, but I would really like, uh, if we have a joint view on this committee, to reaffirm that we would like there to be some diversification of our monies invested so that we are not exclusively exposed to the commercial real estate sector, given that the government has said it has huge concerns about local authorities and their exposure to commercial real estate. And given that, our commercial real estate exposure is already at about 280 million, I think we really do need to have some uh, care and caution with regards to further increases into one sector and putting all our eggs in one basket. Mr. Richard, did you get a comment on that? Uh, thank you very much for uh, that, and, and absolutely, uh, uh, I think looking at fund diversification from the Investor Grows perspective is, is really important. Um, so uh, we have a limited pot 
uh, as it currently stands at 25 million. Uh, but th those that are in the short-term pipeline, uh, there are uh, two residential opportunities that we're looking at, one a three to four million investment, uh, the other a larger scale. Um, but And also, I would add that there are um, clearly many down and other opportunities coming forward. Uh, the, the fund acting as a precursor to how actually you can have a more significant longer term role in the development of residential housing um, will be key. So uh, absolutely uh, we are, I have to say it is more challenging slightly from the funding perspective to secure borrowers partly because of the reasons I mentioned earlier. RPs do have their own credit lines and facilities uh, from a development funding perspective and the larger house builders typically also have their own uh, credit facility, so it, it does tend to find up, but but we're still comfortable, confident that we can get some investment out the door. I, I appreciate that. How, have you already had a meeting with the newly appointed master developer for the many derm? We haven't uh, as yet. Uh, it was only uh, recently come on board, and clearly any funding uh, would be contingent on a number of other factors coming, uh, getting agreed prior to that. So, but we will certainly will do it on the radar. H having met the master developer in the in the tender process, they are very committed to smaller builders operating on the site. In, that's their ge general ethos: is that it's not exclusively the top guys, um, and that was part of their pitch. Uh, uh, and they are already undertaking developments of similar size and scale elsewhere in the country and that therefore I would say they'd be very amenable to having discussions with you at a very early stage because they're looking at the, 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 the things that they discuss with us as members as being opportunities with regards to the many dam, with regards to uh, incubation uh, units, in regards to uh, technical apprenticeship uh, buildings. And those are all things that could benefit our residents as well as meeting the needs of the investor grow. And uh, uh, instead of going for kind of like low-hanging fruit, like one commercial transaction, which takes, you know, 33% of your investor grow fund out in one swoop, maybe it'd be great to have a conversation with Mr. Huggle and his team at the master developer, uh, Urban and Civic, as soon as possible. Thank you. Do anybody else want to speak on this? Council Keating. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for what you said. I think before you came in, I had already referred to the Investor Growth Fund and the lack of information in the report. There's no information in the report. The information it says there's a report coming. But you've already referred to some progress that's been made that could have been mentioned. Now, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just inf identifying that we've had Investor Growth and housing, residential stuff, on the agenda for the last three quarters. Now that's three quarters of a year. And we haven't got one single brick purchased yet, allegedly. So I welcome your report and I welcome further information the next time. So can I now uh, refer to paragraph 8.4 on page 71 the third quarter uh, focus was to explore opportunities to support delivery of housing relating to the borough and key student and key worker accommodation. Then it goes on to report that there has been a meeting with BCART, which uh, one of our councillors has been quite keen on, and nothing wrong with that. But the result is they weren't interested in a accommodation, residential accommodation, but they opened up discussion to talk about an operational facility. Now, my understanding of how uh, colleges for their education work is that they're not financed f for, for occupational buildings by the equivalent of our investor growth fund. But they are financed by the Ministry of Education, or whatever you call them these days. It tells you how old I am. I've, I've still got ministries on my head. Department. <laughs> the department, yeah. 
but they're normally fireless by that kind of thing. So I, I just wanted to ask to clarify, is that appropriate for our Investigo program, or is it not? And uh, I'm not criticizing, just wanting to know the information. Thank you. In, in response to, to the question around uh, the Beacot facility, um, uh, my initial reaction was similar to yours, in, in all honesty. Uh, but nonetheless, we didn't uh, extinguish it in full. Uh, we did want to explore at the fullest extent whether there was a commercial opportunity there that could demonstrate and meet the criteria for the Investor Growth Fund. If it doesn't, it will be, uh, you know, w w once we get to that point, we very we will extinguish at that point. However, we need to make sure we fully understand the nature of the opportunity before we can make that decision. Uh, and it's currently at feasibility stage. It's a very, it's a relatively small um, new development on the campus. They're looking into develop it, and there will be a, if you can term it such, way, a cocktail of funding to be used to bring it forward. Some from DFE, I imagine some, um, uh, some from the enterprise partnership, uh, and probably some from their own reserves. It's whether uh, the investor grow could play a part in that in a commercially robust way, uh, is the question. And I think unless it ticks all the boxes, we certainly won't uh, go much further, but we need to explore it to its fullest extent. Can I just remind you that, that uh, Councillor Cubitt has made a significant point that I would wholeheartedly agree with, that the, the proportion of our current investment is, is nil for housing, com uh, right, and however many thousand millions for commercial property. So. That's why I, I would reinforce that point. Thank you. Councillor Potter. Uh, I mean, just pursuing the point a little further than Councillor Keating, I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to see us involved with BCOT on a operational facility there in what I call the pure sense of academia, because I, I don't think that is anywhere near the criteria of this particular fund. And so, you know, with all the sort of caveats that you've attached to it, I mean, steer clear of it unless it does well even if it, uh, frank has that commercial element to it but can i just ask for the interpretation on on eight four and eight five there's a clear reference to there being no pipeline or requirement for student or key worker accommodation for the college um straightforward in terms of eight five it seems to suggest there might be key worker provision housing provision to do with um, QMC. Am I reading that right? I mean, the demand of one may be different to the demand of another. Are you looking at key housing provision for QMC as well as the NHS trust? Uh, the intention is to keep the door open, if you can, if you can turn with that. I, I think it's unlikely um, uh, that, that we'll be able to uh, uh, come up with a the solution for Queen Mary's is uh, given the situation and that we uh, or the outcome of the discussion with BCOT. Uh, nonetheless, we do want to keep looking at um, all potential avenues and opportunities that we can to support housing in the borough. Um, we do, you know, these discussions that are taking place are all also um, sit alongside the discussions we have internally with the local authority as well as our review of the planning pipeline. So if there is an opportunity that comes up, it is generally picked up through our processes. Um, but we, uh, and off the back of, I think, requests on this committee, uh, we, we do want to make sure we have got all uh, doors and avenues open and opportunities for opportunities for the fund. Councillor yeah, Rattigan. Um, firstly, can I just say I'm very grateful for your discussions with BCOT, at least that it shows that we've We've explored an avenue that I was concerned myself about, so uh, I'm delighted with that. Obviously, the NHS Trust is expanding because with the new hospital not taking place uh, not far from here, um, they are going to have to look to, to house these, and, uh, and I would hope perhaps that you would speak to North Hampshire Trust and see what they, they require. Um, some of the land opposite is now gone to housing, uh, which has disappeared from, from, from the possibility of using that land for, for us to develop ourselves. So I, I think I'd like to see uh, some discussions that we need to support um, the public sector in the, our infrastructure and, and I think it gives us a win-win uh, money for us and an opportunity for decent housing for, for key workers. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair. <coughs> uh, just, <coughs> excuse me, two quick points. Just on Councillor Kubik's point about uh, funding, I think what the government's really concerned about is some councils have gone borrowing money to then reinvest to get a commercial return, which is extremely high-risk strategy, whereas we're blessed with the fact that we've actually got you know, a, a cash available. But I'll, <coughs> I'll make the other, the other point completely different was on section nine on renewables, uh, is that an area where we can actually make money? Uh, I ask that because um, I don't know much about it, but it always seems to be you only make money when there's a government initiative to subsidise things, i.e. at the consumer end or at the production end. So is that an area where we can really invest? Um, well, w interestingly enough, on the renewable side, the, there is one project that uh, is starting to, to bubble up recently relating to the um, NHS estate. Uh, and actually looking at how they can um, uh, f essentially putting a new CHP plant uh, to uh, to support the delivery of that that um, that estate in totality. So and, and it is demonstrating a, a very good return uh, based on the initial analysis, um, but it is also contingent on, as you say, various government funding streams holding strong. I think in that area, uh, whether it being loan or grant funding to support that. Uh, but nonetheless, we are looking uh, very closely at that one. Uh, we're also supporting a pension fund uh, in the north of the country, uh, progressing a very similar project now that is probably some 12 months further down the line. Uh, and the pension fund are looking at that as a local investment. Uh, so if a pension fund will look at it, um, a local authority pension fund, I think you know, it should, it should be something you can get comfortable with. Councillor Cubitt, I think you wanted to come yes, back on just, that. Just, just a clarification with regards to the reference to Councillor Faulkner made. Councillor Faulkner is indeed correct that one element of the government's concern is that some councils are borrowing money to, to then go out and invest. But uh, it doesn't negate the fact that any properly managed fund in whichever sphere, whether it's local sector or bank or fund management, is always required to diversify its exposure. And we owe it to the residents of Basingstoke and Dean Borough, and we owe it to the residents, our taxpayer residents, and the monies that are invested currently in the commercial real, est real estate sector belong to our borough and to our residents, and we owe it to them to have as diversified a portfolio as is possible in order to ensure that the risks that we uh, have for the future and for now are uh, kept to a minimum. Thank you. You both make valid points. Anybody else? Right, we can note that report. Thank you very much. And we can move on to item 10, Treasury Management Monitoring Report, which Mr Hood will be presenting and answering questions on. Thank you, Chair. I'm afraid that uh, Dean's not able to be with us today, so I'll just take you through the, the report in briefly, and then if there's any questions, I'll do my best to answer those. Um, the report basically, as the previous ones, is quarterly report, so it shows the position up till the end of December, uh, and then there's a forecast for the year end. So the forecast up to the end of the year is that there'll be 2.8 million uh, in investment income. So I'm just partly picking up on what Councillor Cubitt was saying. We do have a significant part of our investment portfolio, which is in, in cash as well as in uh, property as well. But the return from that, 2.8 million, uh, that's 163,000 above the, the budget that we have. Uh, and most of that is because of the performance of the, the diversified credit funds that we have. So again, that's attempting to do to diversify our investment portfolio, because that's in a basket of different instruments, invest, invest in a dip basket of different um, countries and in different types of stock as well. So the value of our investments at the end of December was 167 million, so a significant amount of money. Um, there's some interesting uh, appendices, well I think they're interesting anyway, and the, in the back which shows the performance of our funds um, on a risk adjusted basis. I'll just refer you to the page number. To me that, yes, yes, page 93. Um, and basically, what that's showing on the two scales there the left hand side is the return, the right hand side is the risk. 
So the best position to be at is to have the high return and the low risk. So the top left-hand corner would be the ideal position. Uh, so you can see the blue spot in the top left-hand corner representing our fund. Uh, let's see, there's, there's nobody else in all the other funds that are there, like all the other councils that are achieving a higher level of return with, uh, with more, without taking more risk. Uh, see there's, there's one that's higher up, but that's taking more risk to achieve that. And a similar sort of picture on the table below, which is looking at the external funds. These are the diversified credit funds, those sorts of areas there. Again, showing a healthy return there, nearly 3% return on those funds, and relatively low level of risk because we're invested in relatively uh, stable funds there. There's a lot more volatile things that we could go into, which would, you can see some of the people on the far right-hand side have got negative returns where perhaps they might have been invested in, I don't know, equities or something that was much more or volatile, but there's always risk. Whenever you're trying to get more return, you've got there's more risk, yeah. so it needs careful management. Uh, all of the work that's been carried out up in the year to date is all within the Treasury management strategy and all within the limits that have been agreed there. Um, so, I think if there's any questions, I'd be pleased to take them. Very much a, a matter of uh, situation normal. I'd like to suggest any questions on that. Okay, I think it's safe to note the report. Thank you very much. Agenda item 11, and we are into the accounting policies and changes to the statement of accounts for 1718. This is where the excitement starts. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. If I do a brief introduction again to this. Again, sadly, um, again, Dean's not able to be with us um, today. I've got Neville Button beside me, who's in our corporate finance team. So if you have got any detailed questions on the, um, the policies and so on, and I'm sure Neville will do his best to answer those, or we'll take them away and come back with an answer later. But basically, the uh, report that's in front of you, it's up to Kevin to uh, agree as the Chief Finance Officer the um, financial policies, but it's best practice that we come to you as a committee uh, to consult with you and so, so that you understand the policies that are going to be included in the um, statement of accounts that will be coming out as the external auditors we're talking about at the end of July. Very few changes to the, the statements for 2017-18 or to the policies for 2017-18. Um, I think the, the biggest change I spotted there was that they're changing the expan explanatory forward. It's going to be called the narrative statement instead, and there's going to be a bit more information in there <laughs> to, uh, to try to make it clear what the council's objectives are and how they link in with the, the sort of financial context of the council. The change for the following year, which is also included in this report, um, is, also, is about the investment policies, because there's something called the IFRS, uh, which is International Financial Reporting Standards, which is a new one of those coming in, which will impact uh, potentially on next year. And it means that we need to, or Kevin is proposing to, uh, nominate that our investments that we have in diversified credit funds, our long-term investments, that we continue with the same accounting treatment as we have for those at the moment. So if their capital value goes up or down, we don't show that as a gain or a loss to our revenue account. We, sh we show that as a just a balance sheet type change, if you like. Um, and we propose to do the same again in that area because those are long-term investments that we were holding for three to five years. The shorter-term investments, the um, absolute return bond funds, which we recently invested in, those would uh, show up in our accounts and we would show any change in the value of those in our revenue accounts and there would be either profit or loss. But they're much less volatile and those can be... Uh, the idea of holding those is that they're more liquid investments that we could sell if we needed to uh, at shorter notice. Uh, I think that's covered the main main areas. I see Kevin's, I don't know if Kevin's got any more he wanted to add. No? no. no. <laughs> <laughs> For the benefit of the members of the committee, can you tell me what the implications are of putting movement through the revenue account? Basically, what we are trying to do is to avoid any change in capital values showing on our, effectively, our council tax requirement, if you like. So if the value of our diversified credit funds increases during a year, uh, that would be, it's, it's like a value of shares, if you like. So if the value of the share goes up, what we'd be saying is we won't show that as a, 
again, extra income during the year. We'll show that as a change in our balance sheet value. If it goes down, we won't show it as a loss during the year. So it doesn't have these capital changes, like the changes in the value of our buildings, doesn't have an impact on the council's income and expenditure during the year. It just has an impact on the balance sheet and the value at which we hold them. And we avoid it having an impact on the revenue account or the council tax, if you like, through accounting adjustments, which the council is allowed to make uh, in accordance with accounting practice. Right. Any council footballer? Just on that point, that, that, that's what most commercial accounting does, doesn't it? You know, asset, revalu asset revaluations go through a balance sheet, not through a profit and loss account. I mean, what the, well, these new IFRS rules are bringing a commercial approach to the council. So it depends on the nature of the asset that you have. Um, and the reason that we would ex explain more detail in the, uh, the report here, but if you've got a, an asset which is share-based and you, you know you're going to be able to sell it, if you want to sell it and you know you, somebody there is going to buy it from you, then you would be showing the change in your accounts. If it's something where you haven't got a, a guaranteed um, what they call puttable option, a guaranteed option of being able to get the money back straight away, then you don't necessarily have to throw it, show it through your accounts. I don't know if that's like, I don't know if Kevin wants um, to add a Well, uh, just, just maybe some, f some, some other clarification, members. So, yeah, what we're looking to do is to continue with the same accounting treatment in effect as we've got now. So it's just to ensure that those longer-term assets the volatility that may occur in a, in a particular year doesn't impact on the revenue account because that may well be make decisions around those investments uh, sort of a per perverse incentive to hold or not hold them. Um, that's still subject to agreement with the external auditors um, and we will need to go through that through that process but also as a sector local government as a whole are looking at uh, that and are looking for statutory overrides on those as well so as you members will be aware, there are a number of accounting um, requirements where we have to account in a certain way, and then uh, under statute, they're rev the impacts are reversed so they don't impact on the council tax. Uh, this could well be an area that the, um, well, it's now the Ministry of Communities and Local Government, um, could uh, put in a statutory override so that even, even if we had to account for them through revenue, they would be reversed out. So it's still an evolving uh, thing. It doesn't come in for this year's accounts. It, as, as Phil said, it comes in for uh, next year. Um, but it's just a, a heads up that this is where we're, we're looking to go. Anybody else going to admit to having a question? <laughs> 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 okay, I think we are in agreement with the proposal. We look forward to uh, hopefully a statutory override and certainly agreement from the external auditors. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. You. Item 12. Internal Audit Progress Report, Mr Bevan. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is the um, progress report of the work done by the Internal Audit team uh, between December and uh, February this year, and also an update on the latest position for um, the outstanding recommendations. Uh, in my report table, f uh, f the table on paragraph 4.1 on page 109 uh, shows the seven reviews that we've completed. Um, which you'll see we gave three full assurance and four substantial assurances. And the summary of those reports are included in appendices two to eight um, of my report. On paragraph uh, 4.2, page 110, I refer to appendix one, that shows the current two overdue significant recommendations. Um, and we have had latest management response on those, those two overdue recommendations. And appendix nine, uh, which is paragraph 4.3, page 110, shows the 17 uh, fundamental significant recommendations uh, that we have outstanding but are not yet overdue. Um, uh, that was all I was going to say. I'm happy to take any, any queries you may have. Members? Silence signifies consent.
note the report. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
um, there were a number of issues that were flagged up on pink papers by Deloitte's, and uh, they are very knotty, chewy issues that were flagged up by Deloitte's that we paid a lot of money for to do the evaluation on the tender bids. And I would like very much that we are kept apprised and appraised of the concerns that were flagged up by Deloitte's, that they are being addressed and dealt with in uh, a proper way. Mr. Country, do you want to answer that one before I ask the committee what they think? I'm more than happy to add that to the plan if that's uh, the consensus of the committee. Is that the wish of the committee? Yes, it shall be done. Councillor Keating. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm talking about 4.10. It says we, did, we provided 50 hours of audit at a less than 500 quid a day. Is that the relevant price to be paid anyone? It's, um, it's 50 days uh, we're, we're yeah. working on, and that uh, does include a 10 percent management fee, sure. um, and they, they get my cheapest resources, which is why it's manageable. Councillor Westbrook. Thank you. Um, page 177, planning development talks about changes to mandatory HMO licensing likely to result in significant impact. Oh, sorry. Oh, am I? Sorry. We shall come on to that in a minute. <laughs> right, we are asked to approve the internal audit charter and approve the internal audit plan. Is that the wish of the committee? As we've just... As amended by the committee, yes. Okay. Right, agenda item 14, review of the corporate risk register. Mr Gundry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is the, the six monthly progress review of the corporate risk register that's undertaken by SLT. Um, you will note in the paper that there have been uh, two changes to risk scores and they could be f the details of that can be found in paragraph 3.2 on page 1168 and you will also notice that there's a new risk has been identified by SLT and the details of that can be found in appendix 1 on page 155. Um, that's all I have to say, Chair. I have Councillor Westbrook waiting to speak. Yes, um, the, which are you after the, the new risk? Yes, yes the, the new risk is on page one, where, where's he gone? Yes, yeah, sorry, one, yeah, apologies, thank you. Yeah. It's um, 183 uh, to 184 is the new risk, uh, REF RR11. Councillor Westbrook, you have the floor. <laughs> Page 177, um, H, changes to mandatory HMOs likely to result in significant impact. Are we talking about resourcing impact? Sorry, uh, I can't actually answer that question because that's the, the detail of the risk, but, but I can uh, uh, speak to the borough, uh, the Executive Director of Borough Council Services to uh, get the answer for you on that one. Thank you for that. Councillor Miller. Yes, Joe. Just, just picking up that new risk and looking at RR11. Um, standards medium risk. Outstanding business from full council to 26 October. Cleared at 22nd of October, at uh, 22nd of February 2018 meeting. Um, uh, what happened last Thursday about cross party? Cooperation and making gov uh, on governance within the council, because uh, quite a few members were absent. I would like to reinstate that, um, because that it's all to do with the governments of the council. Certainly, in terms of the incidents that were referred to in the report, that was cleared at the February meeting. There have been events since which Mr. Gunnery may wish to comment on. Um, 
I fully appreciate that this is a record of history. It, you know, the statement is correct. It's just that recent events, uh, I'm presuming that this will carry forward to the next report. Yes, um, what will happen in terms of process, these corporate risks are reviewed every six months by SLT. Uh, so when we meet next in August, end of August, uh, the current situation will be discussed to see whether the risk still applies. Uh, and two, if so, what risk score uh, we put, to, put, put against it. Thank you very much. Councillor Kubit. Following on from an issue I may raise in the previous um, uh, agenda item, uh, on page 174, um, I know it's raised in that um, uh, ledger box actually down uh, in this section, but um, I, I, I tend to view, I, I, would, I would consider, but I, I might be wrong, that, that there's greater than medium risk on these projects. They, they, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of pounds. I don't know whether other members agree with me that possibly RR4 might represent higher than a medium risk. We're a local council. Our central raison d'etre is dustbins, planning, social housing, uh, and, a, uh, and, and a bit of road sweeping. And as an add-on, add we have over 300 million pound commercial real estate portfolio. We have an investment portfolio of 100 million. And we are about to enter into a project with uh, new river retail for 300 million and we've got many down which is going to be over half a billion and we've got basing view which uh, you know we're talking about huge sums and we're talking about activities which really are not normal to most local borough councils um and we all because we've all been involved in these projects for a while we kind of think these numbers are normal but they're absolutely not normal in uh in in the central business that we're supposed to be in and if we were a corporate i mean it might it w you know one could almost say that we were acting ultra virus uh with the sums involved with the projects that we're involved with. we're very fortunate to have these projects i'm not knocking the projects but i can just see that if our skill sets aren't there the risks are unbelievable Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, if we didn't have any mitigations in place, that would most definitely be a high risk, but I believe that Kevin would support me on this, that SLT feel that they have controls in place to bring it down to that medium risk. Again, it will be it's constantly reviewed, and if we don't feel those controls are in place, it quite rightly will uh, increase to a high risk. Do I see another hand up? Councillor Rattigan. Can I take you back to RR1, staffing skills and capacity? Uh, we seem to be losing very good officers. Uh, staff turnover seems quite high. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything in this that, that brings the, the head of HR, who's leaving, um, to, to point on this to ensure that we understand why people leave uh, and understanding what, what would incentivize them to stay what what is it is it the job the pay is it the way they're treated by their management whatever it is by us as councillors what what is it that's causing this staff turnover that in my view is a corporate risk uh, because of the 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 skills that are walking out the door and then if we go now to rr2 talking about skills we we've we've just had a conversation about the the uh, bleeding of our assets to make sure we, 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 we get the most out of our property assets. I, I'm not always sure that we have the skill set within that and therefore the training in that to, to ensure that people understand what, what when they said, see a set of, of figures or, or information in front of them, they, they, they can take it to the next step. And I, I, I want to flag to you that these are these are big corporate risks because we don't we don't receive the money we should, and when we recruit somebody uh, to re replace somebody who's left, we are therefore sometimes paying more money to get that person in, and that costs this council money. I'd like you to comment on that. Um, 
thank I, I agree entirely with you, uh, Councillor. And, and again, I will go back to SLT. Are constantly reviewing those. I will um, speak to the head of HR before she leaves. And we do have an interim head of HR in place, so I'll be able to raise that with her, just to identify what do we have in place. Are we aware why people are leaving and what other incentives, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that you you uh, raise with me. Chair, can I just help with that as well? And obviously, information is provided to uh, HR committee, and I don't think staff turnover is uh, historically high. But information on uh, turnover it goes to a, goes to the HR committee, and the HR committee get regular uh, updates on that. Kevin, delighted as I am to see you here permanently. Um, there have been a number of directors leave over the last few years. And, and when you recruit at that level, sometimes the cost implications of, of recruitment are substantive, and therefore any loss should be looked at. As we've mentioned the SLT meeting and uh, conversations with HR, mainly coming out of the internal audit report, there were a number of instances of lack of training where budgets were being quoted as reasons why training had not taken place. I think this is something that should be taken up with SLT because I do not feel that a lack of a budget should be used as an excuse for having untrained staff. I'll just come back on that, Chair. Um, I believe there is budget available. Um, there is a corporate training budget for staff and it's down to ma managers and staff to identify the training needs of individuals to develop, which um, is part of our appraisal process. So there are steps in place. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that on the finance side they'll tell me the budget is there for them. Yeah, but I, I mean, again, I, I can obviously take that back to uh, SLT uh, colleagues, but obviously the process for setting the learning and development plans is currently in play with in terms of the appraisal process and the applications for learning and development go forward to SLT shortly. So it's a, a time, I can certainly give the committee's comments back, but there is budget and there is a process and people are um, identifying training and delivery needs. Delighted to hear it. Councillor Potter. Um, Chair, unsurprisingly, I want to refer to RR11, which uh, I know members opposite are enthusiastic about talking about, as you'd expect. Um, the um, situation, I think, in this authority, albeit I'm a bit constrained today, I think will prove the fact that um, effective governance or lack of effective governance isn't just impacted by the matters that are recorded within this section of this uh, report today, and many of these will become public very shortly, I have to tell you. Um, I think that if I heard um, uh, Mr Gundry correctly, I mean, the definition of the risk associated with this was established by the SLT and not himself as the um, author of the report, which I, I find surprising, but I guess that's the way it's done. Can I make a couple of points, if I may? Um, I see in, what is it, column six, the current status where there's reference to outstanding business from the full council on the 26th of October. Um, that was a meeting that was abandoned because the sound system broke down, so I don't know quite whether that has the um, connection here that one would like to see necessarily in, in between the, the main heading and that um, subsection there. Um, Looking at all of the words that are used in the first section, again, I don't know whether they're Mr Gundry's or provided to him by the Chief Executive, but I would dispute many of them, and I think they're misleading. And what I'd like to see, and we will get this, I guess, as part of a review, is returning to this in due course, because, as I say, there are a whole range of issues which are not necessarily included in here today, and not particularly included in here today, by decision of court. And when we have an opportunity, the Labour group in particular will make comment on these, both publicly and within the sessions. We're constrained at the moment from doing this because of some of the legal restrictions that apply. And I do say to colleagues opposite, we don't walk out of a council meeting for no good reason. And that will become very clear to you in due course. And our side of the story will be told. And I think that will moderate, I have to say, will moderate the type of report that we have before us today. Once the full story is told, Chair, it's difficult for me to go beyond that today, really. I regret the fact this has been included in the way it is, because I think it's a very one-sided um, summary of events. Um, and much more will be said about this in due course, Chair. I'll take Councillor Kibbit first. Just to be avoided for that, we 
on the Conservative side don't know why you didn't uh, attend the meeting. So as far as we're aware, it had nothing to do with us as a political party. I just... Mr Gundry, you're, you're trying to get in. Uh, it's just a uh, matter of process uh, for, for risk management. Um, the Corporate Risk Register is a document that belongs to SLT. They are the owners of the, this document, and the words within this document are those of SLT. Um, I am merely the, the Council's uh, risk ad ad advisor, and I present the report, because it's a co co coordinated report to the committee. So uh, uh, they are not my words. Um, they're not my opinion on the risk that the corporate risk of the council is purely of SOT. I would remind Mr. Gundry we do have traditions regarding shooting messengers. <laughs> 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 Anybody else on this topic? Catherine Rattigan. Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know what the reason was, but whatever it was, I'm obviously they're not going to storm out of a, a meeting without due cause. But as for the, the comment that says the slowing down of decision making, can I just confirm that it was one of the quickest council meetings we've ever had and Sean, you were there. So I would <laughs> So look, it, it, it's important that we, we do have good relationships across the, the, the aisle politically and, uh, and amongst our, our off, with our officers. So as we get the, the best outcomes, the best outcomes are strong opposition, therefore we'll get good administration and I think that's what we're all positively trying to achieve. Councillor Ratt Potter. Councillor Rattigan has helped me obviously by drawing attention to it but in terms of the reference to slowing down of decision making I am not aware of any decisions that have been slowed down by, no I'm just saying that's the fact and in regard to the um, Increase in formal complaints through a variety of mechanisms. Again, let me put it on record, I'm not aware of any complaints that have stemmed, emanated from the Labour group in this regard. Where there have been complaints, they've come from um, other councillors of other parties and from officers. So let that be put on record as well, if I may, at this juncture. The point is noted. I would actually like to um, thank all the members of this committee for the way in which we have all contributed to the effective governance of this committee, so thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Kiebert, you were still trying to say something? I was worried that you are about to wrap up, and Councillor Watts had said to me on Thursday evening that he was very much hoping to come today. And um, it was quite sad that, I mean, sorry, this is something separate, that we didn't say uh, goodbye to Councillor Watts and thank you, because he's, he's retiring. And he no, I didn't know he was retiring. So even though he's not here, um, if you could um, uh, uh, say a few words to him, it would, it would be great, because he, he was elected first in 1972. Whilst he's not obviously a Conservative councillor, I have huge uh, you know, respect for him and the 10 years that I've worked with him uh, 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 um, as, as, a, as a fellow member. I will, I will certainly drop him an email and um, thank him for his work on this committee uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, I think he's made an excellent contribution to the council for many years. I hadn't realised that um, he'd been elected in 72. Well, he's not here, other but he also Okay. Keating. At the end of the full council meeting last week, uh, Councillor Day also said that it would be his last meeting. Yeah. And if you were paying tribute to Councillor Watts, I would like to ask <coughs> if you associate Councillor Day yeah. with the same sentiments. Yeah. Are you finished, by the way? I'm still taking any questions from the, uh, okay. the floor at the moment. Okay. Can I? Uh, you may. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm believing this committee at this end of this meeting. I want to thank you all for listening to me on occasion, actually replying on occasions, and thank you for your courtesy and care. Thank you. As you're here, Councillor Keating, I will thank you now personally. <laughs> I said I'll thank you now. <laughs> but. Uh, Certainly, over the years, I have really enjoyed your contributions, and they have been very good. So we will, you will be missed. 
But I take it this will be your mayoral year, which is why you're okay. dropping out of the committee. I would remind you that the mayor is um, a member of all committees and therefore may attend if he wishes. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Are we satisfied on the risk report? We can note that with the comments that we've made. I move on to agenda item 15, which has a work programme for today with uh, one item, Audit and Accounts Committee self-assessment, which I understand is coming to the next meeting from Councillor Tate. Yeah. Mr Hood. So I'm just going to clarify on that self-assessment. We were talking before about the letter we get from the auditors, um, which is very close to the self-assessment. We used to do that a couple of years ago before we started getting the letter from the auditors. So I propose that you have the letter and the committee's response to the letter from the auditors, which will look at how you've um, assessed risk and, and received reports on different areas of the council's activities. I don't think you need to have two separate reports. We may not need two separate reports. We probably need two separate conclusions. <laughs> and we have a question from the end. Um, <coughs> if, if, if I may, Chairman, um, uh, it, it may not be the, the, the right moment to mention this, but um, we, we do actually have uh, an audit committee effectiveness toolkit, which we've developed uh, within EY, uh, which we are uh, offering to our uh, audit clients uh, and uh, uh, two of your neighbouring authorities, I think at least one of them has actually uh, taken up that offer, so I'd be happy to, to relay that to you or to, to officers accordingly if that would be uh, of, of help to the committee. I would certainly like to see the offering. <laughs> right, so basically we have no work programme going beyond today at the moment, which I understand is because we had not agreed the calendar until the last council meeting. So that was left as outstanding as we didn't have any agreed dates. However, I would ask Ellie to put together a work programme and circulate it to the members of the committee so that at least you know what's coming up. Right, item 16, we don't need to go worry about the exclusion of press and public, and we have no confidential items. So, meeting closed at 4.05. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.